All righty then. Uh, I've got the wonderful Tim. We were just pronouncing it. Chasing, chasson, chasing, whatever you're having yourself. But you say chas- you say chasing. Chasing. Yes. Yeah, that's how we say it here. But I'll say chase on because that's how it's spelled. I actually am teaching my son to read right now. And we were going through, uh, you know, how to spell his last name. And he was sounding it out. And chase on. He's like, it should be I and dad. And I said, yeah, I know. I've been saying that for years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we say chase on. Well, it's it's really really good to see you, and um, of course we we know each other from uh, many a late night festival and and show in 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 the United States and across the world. And you're maybe it's fair to say best known as the fiddle player with the East Pointers, but known in your own right as well. So give us a little bit of background, Tim. Your PEI yeah. Prince Prince Edward Island for the uninitiated fiddler. <laughs> Etc. Uh, so we, we'll cover all that. We, you know, we're going to talk about the East Pointers because, of course, we we want to talk about that and we want to talk about Cody. Uh, I also want to talk about the Tune Room and a whole bunch of other things that you're doing. So yeah, a the, the little bit of a rundown, the, el- the elevator uh, pitch here. I'm from uh, Prince Edward Island, which is like on the east coast of Canada, so um, close to Nova Scotia, Newfoundland, that that area, Cape Breton Island. And uh, yeah, I grew up in a, not unlike yourself, I guess, like a musical clan. There's, yeah, a whole whack of us. I think I have about 55 first cousins on my dad's side. And then the, the fiddle playing goes back. Uh, they tell me eight generations of fiddlers and, and drinkers <laughs> trying to break the chain. But um, the, uh, yeah, I, I grew up playing fiddle. Like I, I first started in a in a band with my older brothers and cousins uh, as a bass player, a Celtic kind of rock uh, outfit where we toured, and that was kind of my first uh, taste of of touring. And then I I got into songwriting as a teenager as well, and yeah, got, kind of got that whole bug and set the fiddle aside for a bit. Basically, I got the songwriting bug and did that for a while, and then well, well t- talk. Talk a little bit about that. Like, were you were you trying to be like an Ed Sheeran type? And Ed Sheeran wasn't around, of course, at that time. But you know, in that role, were you like singer songwriter and uh, hitting the road and all that? Was that? Yeah, singer songwriter, and I. Uh, yeah, it was kind of just I had my acoustic guitar. I actually had a band with me, so it was like when I first started, it was it tended to be a little more on the like the guys that were in my band were like kind of all rock guys, but you know, they, but the music was like kind of alternative country slash folky. But, um, yeah, I don't, I don't even know how to, how to have it explain it, but, but alt basically con- alt country, that's a new one. Yeah. Yeah. It was like, it's not country, but it was like, I, I liked country music. I loved like, you know, uh, like all the, all the dudes that were a little like, uh, like Will Hogue, I don't know if you like if you listen to him. He's an American singer, but uh, yeah, they were like kind of in the country world, but like not you know singing about trucks and and uh, blue jeans and old in your <laughs> your jeans, and bare feet and all that kind of stuff. But um, I I really did enjoy. It. Actually, Cody was uh, he played bass with me in my band for a while too. I kind of I kind of wrangled him because um, I knew that he could play, and at that time he wasn't really so it uh i was like okay why don't you come it, you know learn how to play bass and and he came on the road with me for a while as well and um but we yeah toured toured around and and uh like kind of all over the place really and and kind of i was at university too at the time and uh and got an opportunity to open up for a lot of really great uh acts like in in canada mostly and and in australia as well uh, a little bit in the states and then yeah, and then I kind of went back. Like I always did play fiddle, but um, and then whenever we started the East Pointers, uh, it was yeah. I kind of went back to just playing the fiddle, and and then we weren't really planning on singing at first. It was just like oh, let's just play tunes and hang out and drink beer, and <laughs> and then it kind of developed into yeah, into more songwriting and always trying to grow the sound and and stuff like that. But, was there was there a point in the songwriting kind of alt country uh, journey that you went mm, let's 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 try something different? Yeah, well, you know what, I had I didn't really have any intentions of trying much different. I was just kind of going for it. Really, I had uh, you know a record label in Canada and a manager, and uh, yeah, and everything was going everything was going well. It's a totally different scene than the trad scene, I guess. It was like uh, yeah, I was just like in a 
kind of a songwriting scene here, uh, which there is a great a great one, especially uh, you know on the East Coast of Canada. So many great songwriters. And then it was kind of a fluke. Whenever Cody and I met Jake, we were like, "Oh man, he's kind of like feels like one of our cousins." Like it, and like he spent some a bunch of time on on Prince Edward Island. And we any chance we could hang out with Jake, we were just like, he was just such a great guy. We were like, we just wanted to hang out with him, and such a great player. And uh, we joked about, you know, someday we should start a trio, the three of us. And then I remember we were teaching at a music camp in Western Canada, and we were like, we played tunes together like all night. And then, uh, yeah, and then it kind of wasn't until I think Cody was in, Cody had quit, uh, uh, and for anyone who's listening, who doesn't know, but Cody's my first cousin who who actually passed away at the beginning of, of January uh, in 2022. And he cody was going through a rough time uh he you know he struggled with uh like uh with mental illness i guess and uh, being bipolar and 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 for many many years it was um you know self-medicated with alcohol and drugs and and all that and and whenever he whenever he quit he was staying with me at the time it was probably i guess in early 2014 and then uh yeah, he had been in and out of the hospital for a lot of years. And a lot of people didn't really know that about Cody because he kind of hit it quite well. Although he did get comfortable talking about it after. But he, yeah, he was in a, he was in a really rough place. And, and I said, it was kind of my last kind of attempt to, because, you know, as a, as you know, one of your best friends and, and your, and your family. And when you see someone struggling that much, it's, it's tough and it can wear on everybody too. And my kind of last little attempt at cheering code up was like, I called up Jake and I was like, man, you got to come down to PEI. Just like, what are you doing? Like ASAP, like this weekend, because code was writing tunes and we were like trying to write some tunes together. And, and it was like the kind of the thing that cheered him up. And, and so Jake came down to PEI and we just went to a, a buddy's house and recorded like six tracks, I think just one weekend. And we played a little gig at the, at the old triangle pub in, in Charlottetown. And, uh, and I saw a shift in him after that. And it was, I think after that, we were like, you know, we need to do, to do more of this. And, and it wasn't long after that, we just kind of booked some shows in Canada, uh, just a quick little tour. And then Cody had met, uh, Chloe Goodyear, who runs the, uh, the wood Woodford folk festival in Australia. And then after, we had gone to Australia and I'd actually been to this festival a few years prior and I met Chloe, but then there was like a bit of a, a, a liking <laughs> to each other. And I think it was, uh, Chloe was like, I, you know, I'd love to get you guys to come to, to this festival. And still at the time we were like, you know, this is for fun and it's making everyone happy and there's no other, there's no other big goals. So, um, but we went to Australia at the end of 2014 and, and it was, yeah, everything went so well and it was so fun. We were like, oh, we should actually like try to make this more of a, of a thing. And so I, I was like, I'm total. I, I would love to do this as my, as my main gig. I still had some solo stuff here and there, but, um, but I think all three of us committed to it around that time to, uh, yeah, just to make it work in whatever capacity and and i think at that time too we still just wanted to you know have a good time and and honestly and whenever we met you guys and it or like found out about you guys you guys were like such a inspiration for like what was happening in like as far as like you know young guys that are playing great music and uh and touring and and doing so well i think it was for us we were like oh man these guys are like i i had never it was probably around I don't know when the first time we actually met you guys, but uh, whatever it was before that, that we were, yeah, inspired by you guys totally. So, and especially, uh, yeah, just <laughs> you guys are ridiculous at your instruments too. So it was, um, it was pretty cool. Like, and and uh, and it was also also very cool to finally meet you guys and see like you know blending like tunes and songs and and uh, and the energy that you guys capture on stage and um, yeah, it was. Uh, it, yeah it's been a good it's been a good run a good a lot of good times and yeah um was it was it always going to be music for for you you know you're talking about doing your solo stuff you mentioned college 
and then you were doing solos yeah. and, and then these pointers kind of just developed out of that. But was it always going to be music? I think I, I didn't really know. I think I always wanted to play music. I, I have a psychology degree. I went to, to university for that and I had plans to do education. So that was my like, I had no plans of being a psychologist. <laughs> I don't know what I was thinking, but um, but I wanted to be a teacher. I thought, oh, maybe I'll be a teacher. And I started uh, doing like practice teaching and, and substitute teaching. And I was like, no, 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 this is not not for me. I enjoy teaching one on one, but I'm not like meant to be like in a you know a public school system teaching, you know, history or math or something. So I. Uh, yeah, then I kind of shifted gears and I was like, I need to, I did have, definitely had a drive, I think, to to be able to do music um, full time. And I love, I just love making music and creating music, uh, writing songs and and tunes and um, yeah, performing live. But I, yeah, but I do also really enjoy um, teaching other, other people and like just kind of passing these traditions uh, down. Mm. <clears throat> you've you've written some ridiculously catchy tunes i love winter yeah. green is one of my favorites like it's a spin in this house on a regular basis oh, okay. oh thanks a lot yeah that was uh yeah I, I remember cody playing that in the banjo and, I, and he's like yeah maybe we'll write like a jig jig uh set around this like little lick that he had and it was like the main lick and i was like oh no man we gotta write a song <laughs> i was like nothing to write in a, a tune set but like and yeah, I just kind of started singing over that, and then we, uh, yeah, we worked on it with our producer, and it was yeah, a fun one to to mess around with. Hmm. So you you've been back out recently uh, as the East Pointers. Cur- curious about the name. I mean, I assume the e- East Canada is a <laughs> is an aspect yeah, of it. So. It's not much thought that went into the East Pointers name. Like Cody and I are from Surrey, PEI, which is um, like East Point is is like the furthest east on PEI, which is our community. And that's where Cody fished. He was a lobster fisherman for a bunch of years. That's where my, my brother, Cody's brother, uh, also fishes out of there, like a bunch of fishermen in our family. But so it's just East Point. And so the people that are like actually from the community, you know, the little village community of East Point are like, I'm like, we're kind of like frauds. We're not actually from East Point, but we're you know, 15 minutes away. But, uh, yeah, it was just a stupid, like, oh, maybe we'll just call ourselves, like, maybe, like, these pointers or something. And then we, like, did not think about it anymore after that. <laughs> <laughs> it turned out to be a great name, actually. Uh, yeah, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, who am I to comment? We banjo three with four people and one banjo. <laughs> What's in a name? What's in a name? What is it? Yeah. 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 What, 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 it, what's it been like? you know back reimagining the these pointers without cody yeah it's very uh very bizarre i mean even if, if anyone is listening that has lost anyone so close to them it's like it doesn't feel real kind of in a way and i think that uh you know jake and i weren't sure what would ever happen with the band we were just you know had no and nothing kind of attached to what would would happen because of uh yeah, just kind of getting through. But I think the 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 thing that was a bit of the catalyst was what, that we had basically like a, an EP that we had already recorded with Cody. And it was, um, our plan was, you know, to do half songs and half tunes, but we had only done songwriting that uh, up until we lost Cody. So we had six kind of tracks that we were working on and he was so excited about them and, and he loved them. So we were like, and we had just recently signed this really great um, with a really great label um, called Network. Uh, and they, um, yeah, tons of successful artists in Canada and, and the United States and everything. And so we were just really pumped for everything that was shaping up. And yeah, and after we lost code, it wasn't sure, we weren't sure what we were going to do, obviously. And then we were like, we need to get these songs out. He would be he would be pissed at us if if nobody heard these. So we just released them. And then... And then we had other songs that we had written with Code 2 to kind of like do another EP uh, and tunes too. So that was the, so we released House of Dreams, which was that EP. And then, um, and then we released Safe and Sound just, um, I guess, back in, at the end of September. And, and I think that was whenever 
uh, actually our manager runs a festival in Ontario and he was like, do you guys want to try playing at it? And they are like, okay, maybe we'll give it, give it a go. Um, and anyways, and yeah, it's very, uh, very weird, bizarre. And, 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 uh, it doesn't feel the same. doesn't sound the same, obviously. Um, but it's in a way very healing. And I think for, for Jake and I, it's like the closest we feel with Cody is when we're actually playing and actually like making music to like all these voice memos and things that, and different tracks that we have of him. So it's yeah, a bit cathartic for sure. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's very, yeah, I don't even know how to describe it, but it, it is also nice to be back on stage again and playing the songs. Um, we had recently done a tour of Australia and, um, code had such a presence down there too. It's just, um, yeah, just trying, we'll never capture the same energy, but it's just trying to, trying to convey like the music that we have and, and just for people to enjoy it and dance and sing along and, um, it's what it's all about. Mm. Yeah, I got a bunch of Australian banjo players on my Patreon, and they they adore they adore Cody. You know, above all of the Irish banjo players, the Jerry O'Connors of the world, and all of that, they're like, no, Cody, 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 and you know, just rocking East Pointers reels and jigs, and he oh, made God. a huge impact. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He uh, yeah, such a great player, and I think um, Cody is one of those people that re- could really truly connect with with people and i think uh yeah that's a a rare thing he's he's a he was a hell of a guy there's no doubt about it yeah i had tried to get him on on the podcast during the the kind of the covid intermission you know but and i reached out to you and you said yeah he, he probably won't re- respond to your emails you know <laughs> which he didn't which is cool i know he yeah co was also so like so complex in in many ways where um he he lacked a lot of confidence and like even to this like yeah jake and i were just talking about this the other day like um he for so many years i just even cody as a child like i remember this is he was the smartest kid in in the class like by far always had the be- the best grades and he would go into a test or an exam and be like oh god i'm going to fail i'm going to fail this like just that was his whole his whole uh outlook on himself and through life and and uh and and it like just trickled into his adult life with everything he did so even when he played the banjo how good he was he didn't think he was that good and so like everything that he did was like such a confidence uh he had no confidence in anything that he did and the crazy thing was that before he passed like probably i want to say like even a couple of months uh before he passed we went he he was doing a lot of work on himself and he was um like his mental state and, and everything and he uh was doing really well and he's cut the best that we've the best that we've seen him and we went to the uk on a tour at in like late 2021 and yeah like even at the time jake and i were commenting like on just how like usually when we would get off stage he would go to his brain would go to what mistakes he made and um and it would kind of be this like (laughs) you know and then but he was like yeah he wasn't like that and he was much more confident like i remember i'd always be like cody for this like banjo part you need to like step up on on the stage like get out front and go for it he never would and i remember on this tour he he like just did it and he was like so yeah it was like a different he was like a different person he felt good he was like really balanced and and very uh, not so much, not too many lows and, and, uh, yeah. And it's just the crazy thing is like, he, he had passed away like maybe a month after that. So it's like the best we've seen him before we lost him. And it's like, yeah, it's just kind of crazy how it all, how it all works. But, um, yeah, but yeah, he was doing much better. Yeah. Yeah. Life is so strange. I I mean, I, I remember when he passed uh, feeling that sense of regret that, despite being in the same circuit as him for so many years, never really getting to know him uh, that well as a phenomenal banjo player, you know, and he's widely recognized as being technically and musically brilliant. Like he was one of the best. Yeah, no, for sure. Yeah. He's uh, yeah. He was such a great, such a great player and, and, um, and, and just so creative too with his tunes and, and uh, 
you know, one of those guys as well, like even with, with writing songs and, and licks for songs, um, he had like no, um, yeah, there was like no boundaries on like what could work and what couldn't like, whereas as a songwriter, sometimes you put rules on yourselves, uh, of like, Oh no, you can't go from this chord to that chord or you can't play this. But like, that was kind of the beauty of songwriting with Cody too, is because there was, um, he had so many great, like kind of licks and things that, uh, you know like a songwriter wouldn't necessarily do so anyway he yeah he was a brilliant brilliant guy and, and uh yeah i miss him a lot there's no doubt mm. about it talk to me about songwriting do you have a process yeah. uh for me i i would say you know uh jake and i and cody did a lot of co-writing i think we, we wrote a lot together but we also wrote with songwriting friends and uh i get into co-writing a lot um before East Pointers, I used to go down because I had a friend in Nashville. So I used to go down to Nashville just to write and like not necessarily always for myself, but for other artists. And um, yeah, and I think just sitting down and and mumbling whatever comes out and trying to find a catchy melody, something that sticks. And then as far as lyrics, it's just like whatever. I'm always kind of jotting things down that that strike me. And um, and yeah, and collaborating on songwriting, I think is, uh, with people that you trust is, is a good way to get things finished. I think we were always so indecisive about like, oh, this could be better. That could be better. But then, you know, um, we have a buddy that we write with a lot that he's a really good, like, you know, you got to stop. <laughs> That's the end. Like, you know, so you, sometimes I feel like, uh, I haven't finished a song by myself, uh, in a while. I, I still do sometimes, but, uh, I, I just like collaborating and, and making sure the song is as best as it can be. Hmm. How does the yeah. ego work with all of that? That kind of like, oh, I really like this line or I really like this lyric or, you know. Yeah, it's funny. It's, um, I'm sure you could relate to like when you guys, do you guys write together? And do you guys kind of write and bring things in? Our, the album Haven was the first time that we, we went and spent a week together. Yeah. And we, we yeah. wrote, now everyone had kind of stuff written. And so we brought it all together and you know, threw it on the table and chopped it up, which was a difficult process for a lot of guys, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah. You have to kind of be, you have to be open and you have to be, um, like I trust Jake a lot. Jake trusts me. And I think, um, like currently when we're writing, um, there's a, yeah, you just kind of have to trust the whole process. And, and I know sometimes whenever somebody feels like there's, something that really needs to get through it's like okay well let's experiment with that and but not like being yeah you kind of have to leave your ego at the door there's no doubt about that and i think when you do come in with oh this is the idea then it never really works out that way and sometimes i like to go into songwriting with someone and have nothing um because when i sometimes i do feel like i have something good and it doesn't happen then i'm like oh like i feel like maybe i lost something so i think whenever you go in with an open mind then that's the and not too much pressure um that's kind of the best case scenario now, have you written in multiple genres then yeah i guess i have um more yeah like kind of in some like pop stuff and then with you know with obviously east pointers and then i've had some songs recorded by like country singers and uh yeah of all over the map but um yeah it's fun to experiment with it anyway i don't i would love to be able to write more but i think at this point it's just uh just trying to write for you know my band and <laughs> that's about it yeah but, so yeah, i admire the, tell me, the guys and, and oh sorry go ahead no yeah, sorry you froze up a little i was going to ask about six hearts oh yeah yeah that's uh it's been a fun project with um with Emmanuel LeBlanc and, uh, and Pascal Mius, some, uh, Acadians, uh, who are, have been friends for ages from, uh, from PEI as well. And, uh, yeah, I mean, crazily, crazily enough, uh, they lost like Emmanuel's twin sister, Pastel, and who was Pascal's, uh, wife in, uh, in April of 2022. So a few months after Cody and, um, yeah, we've known those guys for ages and, and, uh, loved their band vish 10 was the name of their band and uh it was a few months after that that i i reached out to manuel and um just said do you guys want to hang out and play sometime like just have a jam and um 
I mean, we had seen them a lot, um, obviously after and before, but like the first time to to like actually play, play some tunes and to see see what happened. And we did a couple of um, yeah. There's like a a little fe- well, the Rollo Bay Fiddle Festival, which is the festival that uh, my grandfather started, Cody and I's grandfather, uh, that we still run today. So we played some tunes there and played some tunes at the uh, Emmanuel and Pascal also have a festival um, that they help with in the Western end of PEI uh, where they're from. And um, yeah, so we also played a few tunes there that summer. And then we, we went down to new Orleans jazz and blues last year and um, yeah, did some other, uh, did some other shows as well. And, and, uh, and it's kind of cool to see how they're finding their feet again as, as Vishten and they're doing their, some collaborations and then and jake and i also but we are continuing to do stuff as six hertz and because it's um yeah it's been i think it helped us all four of us a lot um without you know having pastel and and cody and it's it's interesting because we the six of us collaborated many times in the past and then when it when it was the four of us it's uh yeah another thing that's just like you know just what the hell like what is what is going on but um they're they're the sweetest people like and such great players uh and if anyone gets a chance to look up uh vishten which is v-i-s-h-t-e-n then uh yeah highly recommend checking out their music they're Hmm. yeah real deal for sure what's an acadian an acadian is um okay so very very quick history is that on Prince Edward Island in Nova Scotia and parts of New Brunswick, um, in the 1600s, early 1600s, a whole a whole boatload of, of French people came from from France, and they lived here for a couple of generations. I think maybe 150 years before um, they and they like they lived with the Mi'kmaq people, who were the indigenous people of the land here, and and essentially they had their own like way of life. They were not attached to France. They weren't attached to England, nothing until the English came (laughs) and wanted the land and said that you guys need to figure out if you're with like the French or the English, because that was the big divide in Canada at, you know, trying to figure that all out. And they said they didn't want to be with anybody. They wanted just to keep their own ways. And so they said, the English said, well, if that's the case, then you guys were literally getting you all we're shipping you all out here and so in 1755 it was the uh the great deportation which is where they literally came in and and uh and killed a lot of them and also shipped them back to france where a lot of boats actually sank and a lot of them died and a lot of them went to uh kind of ended up in uh in louisiana which is kind of the interesting thing about the cajun cultures because the acadians who were french uh acadian went down were down there and they mixed with like the black people and the and the germans that were there and ended up being like the the cajun uh that's where cajun music comes from as well so it's like with the with the accordions of the that the germans had and the fiddles and it's a crazy and, and the black with the the music that they played and it's um yeah it's a it's a super interesting uh history so actually going down to louisiana uh, to the festival, it, it was really kind of crazy to, because all all they have there's like Chasens down there. All the people with the same last names here are there, but they're um, and and they're like almost referred to here as like the motherland, so the east coast of Canada, which is, but they're very proud. Like the Acadians are very proud of of their culture, and uh, you know there's Acadian festivals, and they still speak French, and it's uh, like it's really here. There's like pockets of Acadians, so the ones that actually stayed were like uh the ones that uh like kind of hid in the woods or or what did whatever that they could to to survive and they were forced to speak english so i'm kind of the product of of the generations of like there's no french in my family at all except now like my nieces and nephews they they finally got a french school where i grew up so there's um so they're speaking french again which is pretty cool but uh yeah it's it, yeah an interesting history unlike you know, not unlike anywhere else, but there's a, yeah, there's a, a big community of Acadian uh, folks on Prince Edward Island, but it's, it, it is small, but it's, you know, they're like, there's a school and they have their, there's tons of musicians. I'm sure you've probably come across some of them. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, uh, 
yeah, a cool culture, just their food and their music. And, and it's a fun, it's a fun, uh, culture. It's like lots of dancing and, and, uh, parties and <laughs> it's a good time for sure. Yeah. Yeah. That's, but yeah, that's, that's a fun. That's a, yeah, that's a, it's that's a fast, yeah. <laughs> it's a fascinating history. It really is, and I love it. It's such a yeah. an interwoven interwoven tapestry. Yeah, yeah, it is. And and uh, I felt like when I went down to places uh, like Louisiana and into the Cajun kind of country, it was like, uh, um, yeah, it kind of hits you more. I think I did I did a fiddle workshop like at, at the festival at the Jazz and Blues Festival, and they had uh, actually they had Pascal and I. And they had two fiddle players from there, from uh, from Louisiana, um, uh, Joel Savoy, 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 or Savoy, I guess, and uh, and Jordan Thibodeau, who were pretty well known down there. And uh, it was really cool. Like the guy who was moderating the the show was asking really great questions, and we were kind of talking about how, you know, here we were heavily influenced by Cape Breton Island, which because all the Scottish people came, um, you know, in the eighteen hundreds. And so that the, the eastern end of the island, because we were close to Cape Breton, um, that was, you know, the boats back and forth. So that was like how we, what we adopted, like even, even though as, uh, as Acadians, we played the Scottish music, but on the western end of the island, they didn't really get the, uh, that Cape Breton influence as much. Although, you know, you think of in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, Cape Breton music was much more kind of prevalent, I think. So, um, so yeah, I would consider what I play as uh, rooted in like Cape Breton Scottish like traditions. Although I, I like fell in love with Liz Carroll like when I was a bit like I think I first heard of her when I was like maybe nineteen, and I was like, oh my god, Irish music and I yeah, and all the players from Ireland. I'm just like, that's that's what I put on if I want to get energy. <laughs> it's like. Uh, I, I love uh, Irish tunes and Irish players like your brother and and uh, yeah, there's so 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 many like the world like I didn't even know much about Irish music growing up because my my dad only listened to you know kind of the Cape Breton like Jerry Holland and and uh, like John Morris Rankin and uh, Buddy McMaster like Natalie McMaster's grandfather like all the uh, or sorry uncle all all that uh, generation of of Cape Breton players. And then obviously whenever like Natalie uh, and like Ashley McIsaac and kind of that generation came around in the nineties, then it really took that music to a whole lot, like took it to the mainstream essentially. So it had a good, I think in a positive influence on the, on the kids coming up to just to keep playing. Cause it's, you know, traditional music can be hard to like get kids into sometimes. So I think that really helped for sure and what's the tradition like on pei at the moment with kids playing music yeah you know what it's it's pretty good like we uh one thing is the the roll of bay fiddle festival that my that my grandfather started the the whole idea of, of him starting it he wanted like to be able to give people free fiddle lessons so any money that was made just went toward pe- teaching that uh, sorry paying a teacher essentially so the uh that's what we did growing up it was it was uh yeah every monday night and and now i have my son <laughs> in it and it's the same teacher so she's uh <laughs> it's a throwback when i go it's funny and and my brother's kids are in it and some of some of their the other little nieces and nephews and um and that i think even just the like i didn't like going when i was a kid i'm not going to lie but even just it to being there and and being exposed to it and seeing other kids playing and um is a good thing and but it is pretty good there's uh yeah there's lots of young players there's a great like trad scene here there's um the college in charlottetown actually just got a music program a few years ago so people it's partnered with berkeley music college in, in boston so there's people coming in and there's like kind of a little new scene happening and some are trad players and some obviously aren't but um yeah and there's like you know lots of good sessions around and um you know it's it's still going it's still strong i would say and there's a lot of great square dances and and uh which is kind of you know part of the tradition obviously so yeah it's still going strong i think yeah so <laughs> yeah. you're 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 currently sitting in your tune room and before before i talk about that 
yeah like you're you've got the east pointers you got six hearts you got your songwriting collaboration you got the tune room which we're going to talk about and you have two kids under five and where do you where does the work-life balance how do you how do you manage all of that running a festival on its own for some folks would be a year-round singular task and you do it along with everything else no i know and we also the east pointers started a music festival too last year uh which is on the same land that uh, that we own and run the Rolla Bay Fiddle Festival. Uh, Rolla Bay Fiddle Festival is a is a labor of love. I'll say that we we the festival wasn't going to keep going because our parents were selling the land, which the festival was held on. This was back in 2015, and so it was actually going into its 40th year. The festival and it was Cody and I, and uh, Cody's brother, my two brothers, and one other cousin. We were like, we can't like this was our favorite weekend of the year it's right where we grew up we can't the land can't be sold to some buddy who's gonna like you know take it and whatever build apartment buildings on it or something it's a beautiful piece of land uh it's like 65 acres it's on the water too through the forest and it's uh so we bought it and uh it's yeah all volunteer non non non-for-profit like just to keep it just to keep it going and and then the east pointer started a festival on the uh, on the on the same land um it got yeah long story but we had our first festival this this past year so yeah there's a lot on the go i would say um i yeah and we <laughs> my wife and i are also homeschooling our uh, little guy this year in kindergarten but we yeah it's all about i'm sure you you know but like it's just about using your time wisely like it's um for me i find i'm i just kind of have my day planned out so that i have lots of time with my kids and i have lots of time to work and uh and i just don't i tend not to waste time like uh if that makes any sense so i wake up early but i go to bed early um and just try to you know some days you're like oh god what are we what are we doing but um and i wish there was more time in a day but obviously there's not so you just yeah and try to dedicate the time to um like i love everything that i do but sometimes i i mean a lot of times i'll say no to things because it's uh like i kind of have a clearer vision of what i want to do and what i have time for and if it's uh if it doesn't bring me any joy or or anything then i then just don't yeah it doesn't happen but but yeah life is busy for sure with with everything but um but not unlike anyone else, you know, everybody's busy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So let, let's finish up by talking about the tune room. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, it's a, just like a music educational uh, site. That is, uh, I started it actually right before COVID happened. I was like, had the idea of, you know, I'm sure like yourself, you get asked to teach at different places and different festivals and, um, yeah and i was like oh maybe i could like do like a website where people would like pay a monthly fee and i'd put up some tutorials and um and kind of try to make it feel like uh, a sense of like belonging and community and just to yeah kind of meet new people and and uh like with our festival on pei i wanted to kind of have that feel but obviously in a more like just online version of it um and yeah, I started doing it just, and then it, yeah. And then whenever COVID hit, I literally had my first tutorials all ready to go. So I was like, this is kind of a good time to actually start it. And um, yeah, and it's grown to like over like 200 members and, and, uh, and been doing like, I have like a beginner's fiddle course and, and, and um, yeah, just kind of teaching tunes from, from out this way. And, and, but I think mainly, yeah, people are like getting to know each other on there. And there's, we have like a Facebook group where, if you're a member, you can join and, and it's uh, yeah, good chats and lots of great um, exchanging of tips and tricks and, and little special guests at all the little monthly sessions, which I hope that you can come on. You'd be the first banjo player. And the last. <laughs> <laughs> no, you never know. You know. <laughs> Does it- <laughs> well, first, it was on one, uh, one session last year. It was fun to have him on. Does yeah. the does the lesson creation the tune create does that take up a lot of time? Yeah, but um, I actually right now I'm doing like a, a fiddle challenge, so it's uh, 
basically every day I'll make a lesson for for people and or five days a week and for beginner players this time. And it's just I I I definitely believe that even more since reading, I'm sure you have you read the book Atomic Habit Habits? No, I haven't had time. <laughs> But it's just, it really is about like, uh, I've read a few other books on it too, like where it's just, it's not rocket science. It's just like, do the thing you want to learn to do every day and you're going to get better. Like there's, you can't get worse. That's impossible. So, um, but yeah, it's just kind of reiterating to people that uh, just consistency and practice. I think there's a lot of information out there where people are like, oh, you know, you don't, it, you know, you don't have to do this to get better. It's like, no, you actually do have to work hard in order to, to get better at something and i yeah just kind of bringing that back <laughs> bringing that back with people it's like just a, a lesson every day and when once 21 days goes by you're like oh wow I'm, i am a better player than i was when i first started so um yep yeah kind of thing yeah yeah, yeah. it's great to see you yeah it's great to chat great to you. you yeah, yeah. thanks for having me yeah. It's been a pleasure. I've always enjoyed meeting you guys on the road, and uh, yeah, who knows what's what's in store in the future? Too.